Brand with the Pewtercast. You know, the Buccaneers podcast you can find on all podcasting platforms on the internet. Hey man, listen, I was wondering, can you like please, please help me out with like a small task I have to do? Uh, you know, it's just, it's just reviewing the worst eras in Buccaneers history. So like, man, hey, what, what do you say? What do you say? Can you help me out? Yeah, James, buddy, I'm going to be real with you. I don't know that that's a good idea. Why are you doing this again? L listen, man, listen. It doesn't matter why I have to do this or anything, really. Listen, listen, the most important thing is that I could really, 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 I like, dude, really use your help. Please, like, please, I'm begging you. Yeah, man, look, I'm sorry. I'm going to have to call you back. I'm, like, way up here in the mountains right now, so uh, you're uh, breaking up on me, and I'm going to have to... Uh... Talk to you later. Bye. Brent? Brent? Hello? Brent, there's no mountains in Florida. Brent? Brent? Hello? <sighs> Dang it! James, it's time for you to review your first era. Have you found someone who will take this journey with you? Okay, okay, look, man. Listen, I've been trying to get people all week to help me talk about this, but nobody wants to talk about it, okay? Listen, you gotta give me a break here, okay? No. It's time for you to begin the suffering. The first era you will review will be the 0-26 start to the franchise. You must find someone or face the consequences. Farewell. Ugh. The 0-26 start to the franchise? Who am I going to find to help me talk about that? Actually, wait, you know what? I think I actually have somebody in mind. Hey, so, Adam, uh, I want to thank you for being a part of this. Um, you know, I know... I may have reached around a little bit. I know this is a, a tough topic to talk about, but I want to thank you so much for being a part of this uh, with me. How are you doing, man? I'm doing great. Thank you. I mean, you know, Bucks won today, so hell yeah. Just real quick, want to mention here, Adam, you do have the Bucking Idiots podcast. Um, you know, for everybody, you know, who is in the platform of, you know, podcasting and whatnot, you guys need to go check out the Bucking Idiots podcast. Uh, in my opinion, you know, probably one of the best, if not, you know, top best po Buccaneers podcasts out there. I'm serious, man. I'm serious. Hey, <laughs> like the I, I I don't I don't ever try to judge myself, man. I uh, I'm probably my worst critic. I just do it for fun. I do it for me. It's my therapy. For those who do listen, it's weird. It's it's I try to be funny. I try to be uh, entertaining. That's why I love I love your show so much, man. Because you're not you don't you're not cookie cutter. You do you do your own thing. <laughs> I think I told you last time I was on the show, man. Um, you know, it, the w one of the video one of the first videos that I saw, or most recently, uh, was the one you did at the park um, <laughs> where, where you jumped in the in the water. Uh, I can't remember exactly what it was. Which one was that? It, it was the uh, Old Town Road parody. The old town road parody. That was it. And then I knew you're one. You're one of my people, James. So, at that point, I knew me well, and you. We we were we're like long lost family. So in this video today, we are going to be talking about the beginnings of the Tampa Bay Buccaneers franchise. One of the worst parts of the Buccaneers history as a franchise, if not, uh, you know, the worst, because you know, obviously, it was the start, and they did absolutely terrible. So. Uh, just real quick, I want to get your history with the team as a fan yourself. You know, what's your background with this team? How long have you been a fan? Um, and just what have your, been your overall thoughts in the early portions of your uh, fanship of this team? Well, I was born in 1976. So I like to say I was born a buck because hmm. we came into this world in the same year. I attended my first game in 82, which happened to be a good year for the Bucks. Um, you know, but that was, it was a weird year because it was a strike year. I think they only played, ended up playing nine games that, that, that season. Uh, it, you know, I, back in the day, I remember going to the game with my dad. My dad always took me to the games. We had a, uh, my dad had a business in Tampa Bay mall, which used to be right across the street. Actually, where, where, uh, where the one buck place is at now, at now, we used to go to games 
And I, like I said, it took me to my first game in 82. It was against the Dolphins. Uh, I looked it up. It was November 29th, 1982. Mm-hmm. And I just remember being surrounded by Dolphins fans. And it, isn't it funny how uh, that tradition has really never gone away of attending games in your own home stadium surrounded by opposing fans. And from that day, that day was born my hatred for the Miami Dolphins and really all other NFL teams. I'm, I'm the weird one, man. Like, I, I don't care for any other NFL teams. Individual players, yes. Like, my favorite player of all time is Barry Sanders. Oddly enough, not a Buccaneer. Um, just was the greatest player I ever saw play, and I got to watch – him annihilate us in person so many times he just gained my respect but uh yeah i've been around since the early days but uh i didn't follow or watch the bucks in 76 obviously because i was just a little baby because of your background as a bucks fan you know very extensive background you've been there for almost since the beginning you've been there for such a long time um i've Mm -hmm. invited you on here today to talk about the dates between September 12th, 1976 through December 11th, 1977 for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Now, Adam, those two dates are significant, and that stretch of time is significant because that is basically what is called the bad beginnings for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, where they did not win a single game to start their franchise. Uh, Just real quick, Give me your overall thoughts about those first, what was it, 26 games? Uh, what, 26. Oh, oh, and 26. So what are your overall thoughts, just real quick, just thinking of that is the start of the Buccaneers franchise, is oh, and 26. I mean, imagine that stretch occurring in today's NFL. You know, there was no free agency. Uh you know the we we I, you know there was some kind of mild form of being able to get you know scabbed players off of other rosters um and uh you know we uh we started off with our first round you know first draft pick in Leroy Selman you, you know that's that's a good beginning but uh that that wasn't enough to carry us <laughs> or to win a game evidently for 26 straight games yeah. And that's with, you know, that's with one of college football's best coaches coming to Tampa. Uh, you know, a guy, guy who historically had a lot of success at UFC, won national championships. And I think there was some, you know, high expectations that thing would ha- things would happen quickly, but uh, they didn't. They sure as hell didn't. No, oh my God, no. <laughs> like, that is an understatement, man. Uh, we're going to be delving into the stats and whatnot here later on in this video but uh real quick you know we got to start all the way up from the top okay you know right up from ownership okay now before the glaziers uh when they bought the team back in 1996 uh the owner of the tampa bay buccaneers was hugh culverhouse now he was the owner from 1976 to 1993 now there's a lot of points here that we need to talk about with hugh culverhouse and we will get into that in a little bit but uh before we start i just want to ask what's your overall thoughts on hugh culverhouse and how he was as an owner during his time owning the buccaneers hugh culverhouse was a cheap mother i'll tell you, I'll tell you that uh he wore his pants real high all right, I think if you uh, if you're Ian Beckles uh, follower, you know because Ian talked about uh, Hugh and how he wore his pants up right around his throat, you know, as close as he could get to that, and uh, he was cheap as hell. I mean, he 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 would make players, you know, pay for their own food on the road, and 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 had, uh, you know, he he spared every expense. I guess you could say. Yeah, <laughs> the guy was extremely cheap. Um, you know, let. Uh, years later let let a potential franchise quarterback walk away over some nickels and some dimes uh, in Doug Williams but um yeah I, I you know it uh my my recollection my memory of the Hugh, Hugh Culverhouse years not a good one Hugh Culverhouse actually was not supposed to be the original owner of the Tampa Bay Buccaneers um, correct 
That is correct. A man by the name of Tom McClowski, McClowski, McClowski was actually supposed to be the original owner of the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Now he was a construction company owner up from Philadelphia, and he actually was going to be awarded the franchise. Uh, then he got into some financial slash maybe legal trouble with the NFL. That was just, you know, basically par for the course uh, it, during that time. And the NFL said, okay, we need a new owner because this guy isn't doing good. Hey, Hugh Culverhouse, do you want the Buccaneers? And basically, Hugh Culverhouse didn't want the Buccaneers. Uh, really bad stuff. Uh, Adam, just real quick. Uh, I don't know if you know this, but Hugh Culverhouse originally wanted to buy the Los Angeles Rams. Yep, he, that's right. He did not want the Buccaneers. And then uh, some deals happened between the owner of the Los Angeles Rams and the owner of the Baltimore Colts. They literally traded teams, essentially, which is the reason the Baltimore Colts moved to Indianapolis in the first place, I believe, something along those lines. Um, and Hugh Culverhouse didn't get the team he wanted. So, like, what are your thoughts from a fan perspective of Hugh Culverhouse didn't even want to own the Buccaneers, and the only reason uh, he got them was basically because the other guy backed out. Yeah, that's that's the way he ran this team. Like he didn't want it. Uh, I think he had a, you know, a deal in place to buy the Rams, like a handshake type deal. It fell through, and uh, he had to settle for a, for, you know, a, an expansion team in Tampa that he clearly didn't want. Yeah, <laughs> and so and so we were kind of like the redheaded stepchild of the NFL because our owner didn't love us, man. He didn't want us. Nah. He just settled for us. Really just didn't feel like he wanted any part of this team. Um, I will also like to say that um, during his time as the owner, a lot of people of the organization felt he was too involved and a fear monger. Whatever, you know, I mean, you can take that for what it is. Uh, during his time as the owner... And he would usually go back on ideas that he initially supported. For example, him and his marketing director at one point agreed to sell Buccaneers tickets at a certain price. Uh, fans complained. So he fired the marketing director. And the marketing director was like, what? I thought we agreed. And Buell Gomer's house was like, I don't care. You're done, you know? So that's just kind of the guy he was. Um... And then also another thing I want to point out is he actually still continued to serve as an advisor to the L.A. Rams while still owning the Buccaneers. Hugh Culverhouse was a very, uh, st to be nice, standoffish kind of guy, you know? Well, you know, attorneys typically had those types of reputations. And uh, him and Al Davis didn't get along, you know, from the jump. Al did not, not like our, our logo. We thought it kind of infringed on his on the Raiders and the pirate the piracy thing. Mm -hmm. And then we jumped in with our own, you know, Buccaneers and the piracy thing. Uh, so I think he, he, he tried to have that change didn't work. And then, uh, you know, obviously had these, these, uh, other legal battles and legal threats. Well, Hugh Culverhouse was definitely a very, you know, polarizing guy. One of the things he actually didn't do that bad though, was pick a first head coach for the organizations in terms of overall pedigree. And that's the next guy I want to talk about, Adam. Uh, John McKay. He's in the Bucks ring of honor. You know, people love John McKay and going back and thinking about him and who he was to this organization. And his pedigree speaks for itself. You said at the beginning of this video, you know, uh, head coach at USC from 1960 to 1975, he would join the Bucks after he left that college. A 127 win, 40 loss, 8 tie record with 4 national championships, multiple head coach of the year awards. Uh, he actually rejected offers uh, from the Cleveland Browns, the New England Patriots, and the Los Angeles Rams to join the Buccaneers. Now, the reason he joined was more money and the fact that he felt the desire to want to build a team from the ground up. So just real quick, what are your overall thoughts about John McKay? Uh, you know, him being the head coach for the Buccaneers, what, you know, what, what are just your overall thoughts about him? Uh, John was a, John was a, a colorful coach. Um, you know, I'm sure you have some of his quotes on standby. Yeah. Uh, he was, he was known for his one liners yeah. and, um, you know, he was put in a tough position and yeah, he came here for the money. Uh, I was aware that he was sought after some fairly big money. I mean, I think he, uh, 
what he got a, a, a salary of about two million dollars that's that was huge for back in the 70s yeah that was absolutely insane for back you know that'd be the equivalent of getting around like you know a 10 million dollar per year deal now basically yeah. you know like a, a gruden-esque type of deal I, my opinion of him, of him is opposite of my opinion of, of hugh culverhouse oh uh, I, 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 I liked <laughs> i liked mckay uh, mckay was put in a real tough position to uh to you know to come into the league and, and to be asked to compete you know with these juggernauts with you know essentially just a, a you know a mix of rookies and then ragtag you know cast offs from other nfl teams jesus it was a, a climb you know it was a climb and that's kind of where i want to start uh at the 1976 season uh now obviously the buccaneers actually became a franchise in 1974 but they did not officially start playing till 1976 and jesus what what a not so fun year uh you know man it they won zero games uh 14 losses what are you going to do? Uh, it wasn't good. You know, it just wasn't good at all. What, what do you think that says as a franchise where you say, hey, we're a new team. We're going to come out there. We're going to do some cool things. And they don't even win a game. You know, what, what are your thoughts on that? Oh, I can just imagine the hopelessness. The ownership felt that the fan base felt, you know, you have a quarterback like uh, Steve Spurrier under center. You know, that guy hates losing. Uh, and to go 0 and 14 and do it in spectacular fashion, um, you know, not, looking back in retrospect, I don't think I would have wanted it any other way. You know, we talked about McKay coming here. And if you really think about it, James, that decision to come here ultimately did bring us a Super Bowl trophy. Yeah. Because the M McKay family was forever entrenched with this franchise. Yeah. Until. Until Gruden kicked, uh, it, you know, his son, Rich, Rich McKay. McKay, off the boat, and now he's uh, now he's running our hated division rival. Yeah, oddly enough, bringing McKay here in '76, going 0 and 14, uh, and then losing another 12 games before we uh, we won our first game. It's it's still and you know ended up planting the seeds for for good things to come way off in the distance i agree uh like you said by the way one of the the quarterback for this team steve spurrier steve freaking spurrier you know i <laughs> when i saw that i just went oh my god of course it was steve spurrier mm -hmm. you know uh quarterback for many years before tampa bay this was actually his last year 1976 was his last year playing quarterback in the nfl he would then go on to you know do some stuff in college nothing special i guess i don't know i guess he joined florida or something like that who cares i don't know uh, he was an all right coach i guess but yeah, steve freaking spurrier you know that guy is legendary in the state of florida you know, for, for so many people and for him to be a footnote in the history of this team is, you know, bad beginnings and whatnot is just, of course, you know what I mean? Um, but going a little bit deeper than Steve Spur, you're, uh, you know, he finished his year in 1976, 156 of 311 passing, 1,628 passing yards, seven touchdowns to 11 interceptions. And I know that sounds bad. But Adam, don't worry. It's going to get a lot worse. Uh, <laughs> trust me. Uh, running back Lewis Carter was another influential player in the offense. He was their best leading rusher. Keep it, Buccaneers lead rusher there. Uh, 521 yards and one touchdown. That 521 yards was the 41st best in the NFL. The Buccaneers lead rusher was only the 41st best in the NFL. So there you have that. And another guy we, we will be mentioning here in a little bit, wide receiver Morris Owens finished the year with 30 receptions, 390 yards, and six touchdowns. Um, What do you think about these guys? These were the leaders of this offense, and it just sounds pedestrian, uh, you know, saying their numbers right now. What, like, what, what happened? How could they do so bad? The cards were stacked against us and the Seahawks. Okay, mm. understand that before the before the college draft, uh, the NFL had an expansion draft, yeah. and um, they uh, they basically allowed you know all the existing NFL teams to protect all but five of their players on their active rosters. 
So they only made five of their players available to, you know, the Seahawks and the Bucks in the expansion draft. And that list wasn't made available to the Bucks or the Seahawks until 72 hours before the expansion draft. Okay? 72 hours. And uh, you could you could say that the talent pool was was pretty thin. And uh, I'm reading a quote here from from John McKay that said um, that most of the players that that became available um, were in their late 30s, were, were in their th- their late thirties, and he couldn't be happier. So you know, but he had a sarcastic sense of humor. He obviously wasn't happy uh, about that pool of players that was going to be you know become available to them. Um, and you know, it's uh, it, it again, it didn't it didn't set this franchise up. To uh, to succeed right away. Did nobody care about this franchise whenever they first came to be? The owner didn't care. The league didn't care. Uh, John McKay cared obviously, but he he's just done because everything's being thrown against them. So all he can do is be sarcastic. Oh my god, I didn't even know that, Adam. That's freaking insane. It just just nobody got two new teams. Who cares? You know, whatever. Give them, give them some like 35 year olds. It'll be fine. The Buccaneers scored 15 touchdowns in 1976. Okay, 15 touchdowns in 14 games. Their opponents scored 50 touchdowns in 1976. The Buccaneers scored 125 points uh, that year. That was the lowest in the NFL, and they gave up 412 points. Uh, which was the second highest in the NFL that year, for a negative 287-point differential. You can imagine that's the worst in the NFL. Um, it was. It was, Yeah, by far. Uh, their kickers, Dave Green, 8 of 14 for field goals, 57.1%. Their other kicker, uh, Miro Roeder, 0 for 3. He, 0%. Uh, come on, you know that. Uh, their first touchdown did not come until the fourth quarter of week three versus the Baltimore Colts. They were held scoreless through through their first two games. They were blowouts, essentially. It was not good. Uh, They gave up 20 or more points in 12 out of the 14 games they played, and they had 50 sacks given up that year, the second most in the NFL. Adam, I can see you smirking a little bit. because Yeah, so what you're saying is, James, uh, they weren't a big fantasy football draw. No, I, I imagine I, ma- I imagine in 1976, a lot of people weren't saying, hey, maybe we should get the Buccaneers, uh, to, you know, to join our fantasy football team. Just there was no positive. Like, there was no positive. No. I, I take that back. There was one. Uh, and we will talk about him in a second here. But j- just these numbers like I, I don't I just can't comprehend some of this. You know what I mean? Like. It's like what you said. I mean, the num- there's n- just everything was stacked against them, and Jesus, it just took them a little bit to get off their feet. But, like, what, what are your thoughts on all of this? Like, God, they couldn't do anything right. That would be like today trying to gather players from the Arena League and the XFL, uh, you know, and then having a draft where they give you some additional draft picks, and then going out week one and playing against – you know, uh, NFL teams that have existed forever. Um, but I don't think they really had a plan. This was kind of made up on the fly. Um, you know, and like like I said, we did have some 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 good I know you're gonna get to the draft because we did we did end up striking gold in the draft uh that year. Yeah. Uh which is which is great. Um but uh yeah, again, you know, we, we earned that twenty six straight losing streak. With uh, with just a uh, a, a bunch of uh, cast off players, man. Yeah, that how you just described that is so perfect. Taking XFL players and taking you know cast offs, guys who haven't played in the league for two, three years, whatever it is, and saying, hey, you guys are an NFL team now, and you know your first game's coming up soon. Good luck. You know that's it. That's that's all it was essentially. You know, uh. I- I'm, yeah, shocking. It was just shocking reading about that, man. Uh, But some of the notable players, like we mentioned here, Steve Spurrier, legendary, you know, coach in Florida. He coached uh, most recently, hey, the Orlando Apollos, hashtag the AAF, uh, you know, champions. Uh, He also coached at Florida and a lot of other places. We all know Steve Spurrier. Um, He is just, you know, a phenomenal coach for just 
the state of Florida, you know? Uh, some other players you do want to take note of, Adam, though. John McKay Jr. Uh, was a starting wide receiver for the Buccaneers this year. And I know you're saying, wait a minute, that sounds familiar. You'd be correct. That was the son of the head coach. <laughs> was a starting wide receiver on this team. Oh my gosh. You know, that's just insanity. Uh, you also had Mike Washington, a cornerback, and Cedric Brown, a free safety, and Richard Wood, an inside linebacker, who would actually have pretty decent careers for the Buccaneers for many, many years. Uh, so shout out to those guys as well. And then finally, the last two guys, Leroy Selman, who we all know, Hall of who? Famer. Who? Hey, oh, hey. Leroy. oh, Leroy Selman, yeah. Who's Leroy Selman? But you may, you may not, you know, not many, many people may know this. Dewey Selman. The brother to Leroy Selman was actually on the team as well. We all remember Leroy. We all love Leroy, literally the whole state of Florida. But Dewey Selman was also on the team. Uh, just talking about these players real quick, I want to get your thoughts on them. You know, your Steve Spurriers, your John McKay Juniors, your Selman brothers, your Mike Washington, Cedric Brown, Richard Wood. What are your thoughts on these guys being the most notable players from that year? Uh, you know, as luck would have it, the uh, NFL 100 list just came out. And although uh, Warren Sapp was snubbed, our very first draft pick, Leroy Selman, was not. You know, the, the guy the guy was a, a legend on the field and off the field. And um, we were lucky to have him. Yes, I was aware Dewey Selman uh, also played for the Bucs. Um, he wasn't a terrible, uh, you know, a terrible player, but he obviously didn't live up to his brother's status in this town and richard wood which richard went by batman by the way gerald mccoy was not the first batman wannabe on this team richard was was known as richard batman woods and if you google him you will see he had like a hand sharpie drawn batman on his loincloth that he played with each and every game and here's a little bit of inside information with Richard Batman Wood. My sisters used to take dance from his wife. <laughs> I used to have a po I used to have a poster of, of Richard Batman Wood on my walls as a kid. Hmm. Well, there you go. I mean, like, yeah, you know, it, uh, that that sorry that broke my brain for a minute. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing. Uh, that's hey, interesting. So Jer Jerry McCoy wasn't even original. <laughs> he I'm got he, he got he got it off of Richard Wood. He, he got, did. He did. He did, but uh, yeah, Dewey Selman, you know, when I was doing research for this, Dewey Selman, he wasn't that bad, uh, mm. and, and I didn't even know he was on the team back in 76, because we all remember Leroy, but Dewey was just in the shadow of his brother, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and, you know, then we had Richard Batman Wood, which I'm now going to remember that until the end of time, so thank you, Adam. Uh, mm -hmm. What are your thoughts on John McKay Jr. being a starting wide receiver on this team because his dad's the head coach. <laughs> hey, I guess you you know, just like other NFL coaches when they when they're brought into you know, like like Lovey Smith and you know, you bring in players you you're familiar with. And uh he was very familiar with his son. <laughs> you know, and his son knew his system and uh yeah, that will never happen again in the history of the NFL. No, I Which is just an, another you know, really cool footnote. That you know to add to the to the legendary uh, roots of this team because there's just, there's just there's just so many you know great great things our our owner didn't want us right yeah or one of our starting wide receivers is the is the head coach's son it literally just sounds like a movie it really does except except the uh, the the good ending didn't happen we got the bad ending you know the good ending would have been oh we overcame all, all the odds we proved the owner wrong we went out there we won some games and we won the championship no we didn't win a game uh, <laughs> you know so we were the bad ending but uh, mm -hmm. that was some of the most notable players from that year I want to mention two quotes by Coach John McCain. You talked about him being such a colorful guy, and these are the two of the most famous quotes he ever gave on his entire coaching career. But the first one is this. Uh, it was after mm -hmm. a game. They eventually, they, you know, essentially asked him, you know, what did you think about the game? And he said, well, we didn't block, but we made up for it by not tackling. Classic. <laughs> classic. That, is, that is classic. You know how when you walk into a locker room, you usually see very inspirational quotes? Yeah. Well, we should, we should just have... John, McCo John Mc uh, uh, McKay quotes up in yeah. Buccaneers locker rooms. Yeah. Because, again, his quotes are everlasting. They still apply to current current Bucks teams, um, you know, who, who don't want to block or tackle. 
yeah, you know, it, it, it's, I, I like, you know, I miss this. You know, I want more coaches to be like this. I know, obviously, with the way certain atmosphere, atmospheres are with the media and stuff like that, you can't be like, well, my team sucks, you know? But that was basically what he was like, because it was just like, okay, you know, whatever, we're just going to roll with it. But the second quote here comes from, he was actually on the sideline during a game, and he was quoted as saying this, can't stop a pass or a run. Otherwise, we're in great shape. <laughs> yeah you know it, also another quote that would apply <laughs> to our current you know current bucks teams it, um yeah mckay was the, mckay was the best the, the, you know those audio bites are still out there i highly recommend you go search them out um because not only were the were the quotes just well done but they were they were also delivered with the great timing he, he he was he was a funny guy man and real quick i want to jump back into to the uh leroy and dewey selman uh discussion sure. for a second they were the first brothers to ever play on the same team in nfl history and or in current nfl history and they had a third brother lucius selman who offered to come out of retirement to play for the buccaneers uh after you know both the selman brothers were drafted here so that's pretty cool Oh, and our second our second round draft pick, yeah, a Florida Gator fullback named Jimmy Debose. Okay, we are drafting fullbacks in Tampa in the second round. You guys are complaining about kickers getting drafted in the second round. We took a fullback, Rich Rich McKay, when he was probably six. You know, it's surprising that that he didn't get a, a helmet and some shoulder pads. <laughs> yeah, oh my God, because you, you might as well at that point, you know, but. Uh... You know, transitioning from that year, obviously they lost every single freaking game. Uh, we move on from that to the 1977 season where, hey, they won two games. But we're not here to talk about those two games uh, tonight. We are here to talk about all the other 12 games they lost before they won those last two games. Uh, Jesus, another dumpster fire. Steve Spurrier was gone. Uh, the running back was replaced and, you know, some other players stepped up in certain situations. Uh, by the way, we were the first winless team. We were. In, in the, his, the history of the NFL. And that, I don't think that was broken until the Lions did it. Um, yeah, the, the, when the Lions did it in 2008 and then again when the Cleveland Browns did it in last year, I believe. Or no, two years and, ago. Oh, and uh, who was the Lions coach at that time? Rod Marinelli was the head coach of the winless Detroit Lions, a legendary defensive line coach, Rod Marinelli, who Warren Sapp and our Super Bowl defensive line linemen will give credit as probably being the greatest defensive line coach, uh, you know, in, in this team's history for sure. And one of the greatest in the NFL. Um, yeah. He also, you know, ties in it to the story because a former Bucks coach then goes on to coach a winless team. You know that's that that that, oh, oh, that's, that kind of stuff only happens here in Tampa. It's infectious. I swear. It we, is. we we spread it out to other teams. You know. But just going over the stats real quick. Uh, the quarterbacks for this year. Steve Spurrier was gone, and in his place you had Gary Huff, Randy Hedberg, and Jeb Blunt. These guys combined for 129 of 317 passing, ugh, uh, 1,714 yards. Adam, three touchdowns and 30 interceptions. Three is that good? Three three touchdowns and 30 interceptions? I don't think that that is very good, <laughs> man. How how do you do that? Like that shouldn't even be physically possible. It, it doesn't make any sense. We obviously tried to run the ball quite a bit. Yeah. Um, but uh, that ratio, again, is is a is absolutely a record that will never be broken. Talk about, you know, Randy Hedberg, who the backup went 0-10. Okay. Zero touchdowns, 10 interceptions. Oh, and then Jeb Blunt, yeah. Zero touchdowns and seven interceptions. I mean, Gary Huff may as well have been Joe Montana with three touchdowns. And 13 interceptions. Shout out to you, Gary, because I know you're a fan. Okay, I know you're still a fan. The number one overall pick in the draft, Ricky Bell. You know, a lot of people remember Rick, Ricky Bell. He finished here with 436 yards, one touchdown. Still nothing crazy. Pretty much as good as the other guy did the year before. But still, hey, you know, Ricky Bell, at least it was the start of something. You know what I mean? Uh, mm -hmm. what, what are your thoughts on remembering Ricky Bell and what he brought to the organization? Uh, Ricky Bell... Phenomenal talent. Yeah. 
if he if he was drafted anywhere else, if he was drafted to a to a you know a, a Chicago Bears or one you know one of the the teams legendary teams at the time, uh, he could have been one of the NFL all, NFL's all time greats, uh, and and likely would be the Buccaneers' greatest running back of all time. Um, you know, had he played on better teams or got here at a, at a different time. Uh, Ricky Bell was amazing. Morris Owens, hey, he improved. 34 catches, 655 yards, three touchdowns. You know what? That's improvement. Shout out to Morris Owens. I, I don't know where he is right now, uh, but hey, shout out to him. He at least improved. Um, 11 touchdowns scored in 1977, Adam, and 26 touchdowns given up. Big improvement, you know, cut those touchdowns in half in terms of giving them up. Not mm -hmm. too bad. 103 points scored. That's still the lowest in the NFL. The second lowest was 134. And they gave up 223 points for a negative 120 point differential. Third lowest in the NFL. And hey, Dave Green was back as the kicker. He went 4 of 7 this year. And the other kicker, Alan Levitt, went 5 of 10 for 50%. Uh... Hey, you know what? Improvement, right? Improvement, we you know? The, we beat the Saints. We beat the St. Louis Cardinals in the last two games of the season. Yeah, and I do I do want to point something out about those two games here in a little bit. But um, it was good to see improvement from this team from, obviously, the abysmal 1976 year to the 1977 year. Uh, their first touchdown was scored in the second quarter versus the Dallas Cowboys in Week 3. Uh, and just really overall better across the board in terms of giving up big games and, you know, stuff like that. I will say, however, here's a bad stat. They went scoreless in six out of the 14 games they played in. Oh, so it wasn't, you know, everything roses and happiness, well, you, but you, we, we, we already we already told everybody about the quarterback stats. You're not going to score a lot of points. No. No, you're when not. you when your quarterbacks through a throws three when your franchise when your team has three touchdown passes the entire season okay if you hey I'm guilty of it all right I'm I'm a Jameis Fencer I complain about the guy all the time and then in the next breath I'm praising him okay but next time you want to complain about Jameis Winston just remember we had three passing touchdowns in in the entire 1977. Tampa Bay Buccaneers season uh, and going scoreless in six out of the four games uh, they only scored more than seven points in four out of the 14 games so it, it was just abysmal you know it's like oh we do good in other situations but Jesus we're still a long way from winning something you know clearly McKay knew Ricky and, and drafted him but uh it was controversial because there was another running back um who was was highly touted um it happened to be Hall of Fame running back Tony Dorsett and we took we took Ricky Bell over Dorsett, and again Ricky was talented. You know, put in the right situation. You know, if they switch spots, and and Ricky was drafted to the Dallas Cowboys, and Tony came here, who knows who knows what the you know what, what history would have uh, was said about it. Yeah, Tony Dorsett could have been the pick, but we mm. we drafted Ricky Bell instead. Well, you know, hey John McCain. Knew, what are you gonna do? You know, John McCain knew who we were. I. Anyway, uh, here's some notable players from that year. It's basically the same, uh, except just replace Steve Spurrier with Ricky Bell. You still had the sons, uh, you know, the coach's son being the starting wide receiver on the team. You still had the Selman brothers. You still had Mike Washington, Cedric Brown, Richard Wood. And now Cecil Johnson came into the mix. Um, the great... The great Cecil Johnson. Yeah, what what are your thoughts on Cecil Johnson since he's the basically the only new addition besides Ricky Bell to this list? Uh, I don't have any thoughts on Cecil Johnson. <laughs> <laughs> As a matter of fact, that's the first time I've, I've I'm you know recollecting hearing the guy's name. I don't oh. know. I don't know about Cecil, but it's a great name. I think more men should be named Cecil. We're going to finish this off, this segment here, by actually talking about something positive, okay? And okay. the, and the okay. positive thing is, is that, hey, they won two games at the end of 1977, and it's really funny how it happened, okay? So they won, obviously, against the New Orleans Saints. That was their first blood, like you said which is freaking mm -hmm. poetic, in my opinion, considering a lot of Bucks fans have stated that their least favorite team out of all the division rivals is the New Orleans Saints. That's just, you know, poetry that we would be the first, uh, that they would be our first win. But there's something I want to note here. The first thing is this quote by John McKay. And uh, you said he was colorful. Uh, he took it to a whole nother level with this quote, okay? After the mm -hmm. win, he said this. He said, well, three 
or four planes crash and we're in the playoffs. <laughs> <laughs> you could you couldn't even say that in, in today's world. Imagine Bruce Arians tomorrow in tomorrow's you know post game you know press conference saying that you know three or four planes crashed. We might be in the playoff hunt. Get it's a joke, and you get that he's just messing around, and it's like. Oh, oh, well, you know, whatever. We're not going to make the playoffs, but hey, it feels good to win. So that's, you know, you got to appreciate the sport there for him. Another funny situation I want to point out right now is that the the media was critical of John McKay uh, earlier on uh, in the beginnings of the franchise. And he said that basically the media did not know the difference between football and bananas. So what did, (laughs) so listen, so what did the media do? I love that. I love that quote, by the way. Yeah. So, so what did the media do? They brought a bundle of bananas to the next press conference and gave it to John McKay. Okay. And John McKay then looked at the bananas and said, you guys don't know the difference between football and a Mercedes Benz. <laughs> did they bring him a Mercedes Benz the next press conference? I wish they would have. They did not, Aww. but you know. <laughs> it's the kind of guy we had running this franchise. I really think that John McKay, you know, missed his calling as a comedian. He had such good comedic timing. He really did, didn't he? Mm-hmm. He absolutely. Like it was just incredible. He was such an infectious guy and such like a a likable guy in terms of his quotes and his jokes. Like obviously he was making the best of a bad situation. All you can do is just laugh at it. You know what I mean? That's all mm-hmm. you can do. So uh, shout out to him for that. But uh, the most important thing I want to note here is going back to that win <clears throat> is after the game, the New Orleans Saints fired their head coach because the owner was so embarrassed about losing to the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. What are your thoughts on that, Adam? I support that decision. <laughs> not only did we win, listen, not only did we win, we scored 33 points. Okay. Now we only had, we don't, at the entire season, the other 12 games before that, we only scored 53 points total the whole season. And then we dropped a 33 on those New Orleans Saints. You got to love it. Beat the division rival that a lot of people don't like right now. Not mm-hmm. only did we beat them, we beat them in their home stadium and made them fire their own head coach because the owner was so embarrassed that the Saints were the first team to lose to the Buccaneers. That's that's just amazing. And then also, I want to point out, Adam, is that the next week versus the St. Louis Cardinals, the Buccaneers won. And then the owner was so embarrassed again that he fired his head coach. Again, I support the decision. You know, uh, we're, we're getting coaches fired left yeah. and right. Yeah. And, um, and really, that was the momentum. You know, a lot of people, they want the Bucs to tank right now, James. They want us to lose out. Because they want a better draft, you know, slot. But just look at the 1977 Buccaneers, okay? Had they made that same d- decision and lost the last two games in the year, you know, they wouldn't have carried that momentum into the legendary 1978 season. It is nice to end on a more positive note, you know, kind of finish with those last two wins. We're getting people fired. So, you know what? That's good to me. We're getting people fired. You know, hey, that's that's good in my book. You know, the we're not... Bucks have gotten a, the Bucks have gotten a lot of people fired. Exactly, both for themselves and for other people. So you know, it's it's all good. Um, but Adam, I want to thank you for being a part of this first you know segment with me, talking about the worst moments in Buccaneers history. Um, your insight has proved insanely valuable. Your personal stories have added a different element and a different view to this really bad beginning of this franchise uh just real quick before we go ahead and sign off here i want to get your final thoughts um and kind of you know put a stamp on the first chapter the first era of this part of the team what are your thoughts on the 0 and 26 start as a whole well the losing tradition continues uh i think we're approaching historically you know that that historical period again i mean we haven't we haven't uh, been to the playoffs since 2012 um th- this this franchise knows how to lose and do it do it in in just the best way possible like like you said we got coaches fired opposing coaches both of them lost their jobs uh after we finally you know get off the schneid and win our 27th game and our 28th game and um you know again coaches are still getting fired today it happens to be our own coaching staff 
getting fired because we still don't know how to win. But if history repeats itself, brighter things are, are on the horizon. Bones are still fresh from that 78 season or 77 season, man. They're still fresh. I know. I'm sorry. Uh, but uh, <laughs> we're being forced to, uh, unfortunately. But uh, again, man, hey, thank you for being on. Greatly appreciate it. Thank you for having me on. Of course, man. Of course. Follow me on Twitter at Bucks Podcast or just search Stank Bastard. There's only one of me out there. I was just about to say, where can the people find you? Because uh, for everybody watching this right now, but go, go, yeah, click off this video right now. Go check out the Bucking Idiots podcast. I'm serious. Uh, it's okay. We'll wait. Give them. Yeah. I have Instagram is at Bucking Idiots, mm -hmm. and that's B U C C A N I D I O T S. Um, I have a Facebook page as well at the Bucking Idiots podcast, mm -hmm. but you can pretty much find the Bucking Idiots podcast everywhere podcasts can be found. Go check out the Bucking Idiots podcast everywhere. Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, all the podcasting platforms everywhere. Go right now. I'm serious. I'm not joking. Adam, again, thank you so much for being on, man. Greatly. Hey, James, now that, now that I've been on your podcast, can you tell me, who's this mystery guy? <laughs> who's, who's this mystery character? I, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know why mm. they're making me do this, Adam. Uh, I mean, are you, are you, if you're in trouble, blink three times real slow i gotta cut the you're being held are you being held by i gotta cut the recording the tom bassinger the tom bassinger dude it's, it's not t bass it's not t bass i promise t -Bass. <laughs> thank you guys so much for watching this video um until the next video or the next live stream we will see you guys in the next one but until then and as always guys goodbye for now and go bucks Mwah. love you go bucks go bucks Oh, okay, geez. I mean, I guess I got through that one okay well enough. Hello again, James. Oh, come on, man. What now? Are you beginning to feel the pain that those before you felt? The constant lack of winning will soon open your eyes to how terrible the Buccaneers franchise is. Only then can you realize your potential and join me on the dark side. Okay, hey, listen, okay? It's gonna take a lot more than the 0-26 start of the franchise to get me down. Like, listen, it's seriously gonna take a lot more to break my spirit, okay? Oh, but that was only but one era you have to review from the many terrible moments in Buccaneers history. Your task is far from done. I will give you your next era to review in the near future. Don't worry, James. You will join me in hating the Buccaneers soon enough. You will then know the true power of the dark side. Farewell. Ah, oh, jeez, another era? How, how? How am I gonna keep on doing this? You gotta believe, James. Who just said that? What? Mike, what are you doing here? Look, James, listen. I know this guy's trying to keep you down, but you can't give up yet. I know it's going to be a tough journey, but you have to overcome it. You have to be strong. For the fans, James. It's for the fans. Jeez, you know what, Mike? You, you know what, Mike? I think you might be right, okay? Yeah, yeah, sure. Sure, the going's going to get tough, but that's when I get going. Yeah, you know what, Mike? You're right, okay? I am going to persevere. I am going to get through this, and I'm going to show that mystery person who's the boss of this channel, and he is not going to stop me. Keep going, James. I'll always be watching after you. Farewell. Thanks, Ghost of Mike Glennon. Well, I guess I gotta go get ready for the next era to review. All right, let's do this.